right, youth, come on up here. I think Daniel should go first since he asked who was going first. <laughs> don't ask questions you don't really want the answer to, Daniel. Oh, okay. You won it first. That's fine. Um, I guess they're going to they're gonna share their experience from resurrection. Apparently, Jacob is too. Um, and um, I do have to actually tell you, if you see a couple of us have on our resurrection shirts, and it actually has the scripture from the weekend on there, which is not the scripture that Andrew read. We didn't take leave of our senses. Um, the scripture for the weekend was actually Romans 15:6 which I invite you to look up at your leisure, but um, we decided to change it because truthfully, nobody ever mentioned that scripture the entire weekend. They didn't talk to it, they didn't speak to it, nothing. So um, the one that um, Pastor George kept coming back to constantly was um, specifically 2 Corinthians 12:9, um, and we expanded it a little bit um, from what Andrew read. So that's why we changed it, um, in case you have seen any of that listed somewhere. Um, we did not just go crazy. So, Daniel, you're up. So today I'm going to be talking about how God's grace is even in the most horrible, horrible places. I liked how he talked about how his love was even in a strip club, a bar, and even in a back alley somewhere where people are selling drugs. So, uh, I like the story he talked about. The lady is a stripper, but it's the only job that could help her special needs uh, kid. So one day, uh, she was offered more money than she could ever earn, earn in a year to have sexual intercourse with this man. So she had heard of a so-called God. So... She went to the dirty strip club bathroom, got on her knees, and cried out to God, and he answered. But there's, there was many bumps in the road of her life, but eventually she figured them out and had became a person that was... She became better than anyone would ever thought she could have. So I like that story because it shows, even if you start out in your life horrible, that God will come after you no matter what and will change you into something great. So another story he talked about, uh, there was a biker in a bar, uh, and he, was, he went out, he came out of it one day, and there were missionaries handing out pamphlets about God, so he grabbed one, pushed them to the ground, and rode away. So about six months later, he was in an inn. He drank oh, a whole bottle of his like favorite drink, drunk as, you know, drunk. <laughs> so he planned on committing suicide. So, but when he went to pull out his gun from his bag, he pulled out the pamphlet, and he's like, okay, this one hurt. He opened it up and read about a loving and caring God, which changed his life forever. Those two stories show that God is even in the most horrible places, and if you don't want him, he'll still come after you. I just liked how he talked about, the, the speaker talked about how God is like, well, speaking to, like, Reckless Love of God, that song. God will come after you even if you don't want it, even if you don't even believe in him. He will come after you, and he will save you if you believe. That's all I really have to say. Howdy, how's your day been? <laughs> well, uh, since Daniel decided to take all the stories, I'm, you know, I'm just going to talk about, you know, two things that I learned over the course of resurrection. One of which was prevenient grace 
And the second of which was, I'm really good at pool. <laughs> so, provenient grace, you might be wondering, you know, what in the world is that? That's the, that's the cradle. But provenient grace is before the cradle. God has grace for you and love for you before you are brought into this world. And I just, I think that's a wonderful thing. That, you know, that, that stayed in my heart. And uh, I, I'm going to try and keep this brief because I'm not good at public speaking. But <laughs> I don't want to hear that coming from my pastor. <laughs> We like to have fun here at Trinity United Methodist Church. Come and see us. But uh, yeah, that's, that's most of what I have. You know, the provenient grace, that, that really stuck in my mind because a God that can love me before I'm brought into this world must be an amazing God. So uh, that, that's all I have. <laughs> Well, uh, like Jamie, there were two things I learned this weekend, uh, Profenia Grace, and that Jamie's really good at pool. <laughs> so, but uh, but uh, Daniel uh, did leave out one story uh, that about a uh, woman who was uh, heavily addicted to drugs, and uh, every Sunday she would stop by our local church and uh, drop her kids off to, you know, just hear the messages, and she would run off and uh, go get drugs during the church service, that way your kids didn't have to see it. Um, so, one day, with both of her kids in the car, and a drugged up rage, she was going to run over and kill uh, her boyfriend. So, the kid in the front seat, he knew what was going on, and he looked at her right in the eyes. And uh, he said, Mommy, I, I don't think God would want you to do that. And it, uh, it kind of just made her realize that she needs to not just drop her kids off, but stay with them to go to that church. And it came to the point to where she was going to get baptized. She got saved, and she was ready to get baptized. And the morning that she was supposed to get baptized, she started shooting some more drugs. And uh, the church called her and said, hey, where are you at? You know, it's time for your baptism. And she said, I, I can't do it. I, I just, I've already took some more drugs. I can't get baptized. So uh, the church members actually uh, came to her house and they dragged her out of her house and threw her in the car, uh, took her to the church and baptized her in a horse trough. And uh, to me, that story was uh, one of the biggest stories that spoke to me. And uh, like Daniel, the story has kind of stuck with me until I got home. And, uh, you know, the pastor really just portrayed it in a good way. And that's really all I have to say about resurrection. So. Hi, I'm uh, Andrew Goodman. And uh, I get to see resurrection in a different, like, standpoint where I'm CCYM. Instead of, like, in the seat and, like, in the sessions, I'm kind of doing some leg work behind the scenes. And a funny story, I was back there getting ready to get on stage for one of the, uh, for one of the dances I had to do. I think it was the first session. And this guy come and shook my hand, and I didn't know who he was. Turns out he was a speaker. And <laughs> I was just talking to him, and I didn't know who he was. But... Yeah, that was kind of bad. But um, I just, when you go and you just, when I was on stage and you look out there, you don't realize how many people actually come to this thing until you're standing in front of all them. There's, there's so many people. And um, it just kind of changes your look on it of how many people are there worshiping together and accepting a God like no other. And that just kind of changes you in a way. And uh, I need Jacob to come up for this next part. We're going to talk about the YSF offering. Do you, mean, do you want me to read this? Yeah, go ahead. 
I'll read this. Okay. Okay, the resurrection offering this year was devoted towards uh, Resurrection Costa Rica 2019. And in the span of two days, they raised around $29,000 in both sessions for that event. And um, CCYM, we got to team up with the Costa Ricans that came to uh, sort of just get the word out and help them get the funding and stuff. And during that process of me talking to them, I, they are asking people to come down to Costa Rica with them. And I was intrigued by it, and I've decided that I want to go down to Costa Rica, me and Jacob, for seven days and help out with this organization. And uh, we need help with some funding. <laughs> but if you want to help fund us, contact us after church or if you have our phone number. Oh, yeah. If you don't know Spanish, get this app called Duolingo. I'm halfway fluent. <laughs> Hola. Hola, como estas? How are it? How is everyone today? My name is Jacob Goodman, and as Andrew said, we are uh, trying to raise some money for us to go to Costa Rica and uh, have an amazing experience once in a lifetime. We are going down there to uh, help out with basically what we're doing is what we do now, like as CCYM, we're just going to be like, where this is their first ever one, they need people who've been to Resurrections and understand how it works to come down there and kind of show them how to do it and like kickstart it. So that's why they're asking youth and leaders, so any of you all can go to if you want to come. And they go down there and we're going to basically show them how we do our Resurrections so they can get like a standpoint on it and kind of grow like ours has over the years. And hopefully it becomes this nationwide thing down there and this massive Christ event. Yeah. I was really touched by the stories that they had. They had four or five Costa Ricans come. Six. Six? Yes, six. Costa Ricans come and they spoke and they told their message and their story and their, uh, I forgot that word. Testimony. Their testimony. There we go. I'm sorry. I, I get a little flustered when I'm up in front of a bunch of people, but uh, Poor people. Hmm? they really, they <laughs> so they really touched me and they really, with their messages and everything, uh, the only thing is I got to learn Spanish. And so if y'all know any good Spanish tutors, I might need to borrow, so. <laughs> yeah. And if. Uh, That's all we have. Yep. So. And if y'all. We, it is uh, $1,550 a person. But it's that pays for airfare, food, transport, lodging. lodging. It pays for everything, the whole deal. You need to free Basically. Basically, yeah. But but you know what? There, there, there's this little thing Jesus said. It, it's a weird thing. And it says, ask can you shall receive. receive. But if you don't ask, guess what? You shall not receive. <laughs> oh, okay. Hello, my name is Jacob Goodman, and I'm here to uh, uh, ask about a Costa Rica trip. We are trying to raise $1,500 and $1,550 a person a piece to go to Costa Rica, and it co and it will pay for our flight our board, our stay, our food, and everything. March. It's in March. No, no, it's not March. October. Oh, my gosh. Oh, o October. October. And then also, you see this uh, banner. I'm just going to mention this because this came from me and David. But there's a banner that keeps on popping up in this uh, with us posing in front of it, all the family photos. That was David's design, but when I was CCYM president, I got it put on a uh, banner f to go behind the CCYM table. And if you just read it, it has a good little message. message type thing. It has a bunch of different ways, God's grace and love and compassion. And that's all I got on that. The power shift.
plug it in. Sorry, technical difficulties. I um, thought the battery would last longer than that. Um, one thing that um, they kind of didn't really, I'm a historical type person. Maybe it's the history degree hanging on the wall at home, but I like to kind of see how things have, have grown. And when you think about it, resurrection started 35-ish years ago um, in just a small little hotel setting in Gatlinburg, Tennessee you know, handful of folks, and then it just kind of started growing and growing and growing. And a few years ago, they actually had to move out of the convention center in Gatlinburg to the LeConte Center in Pigeon Forge because it was bigger and it held more people. And um, the reason for that was because the event just kept growing. And so now they have in the ballpark of 12 to 15,000 youth and chaperones that come every year. And what started all those years ago is kind of a small event, hoping it would grow has now gone international. And so like these guys were saying in October, they're planning to go to Costa Rica to do the same things that, that we've done for years in Pigeon Forge and Gatlinburg and to now take them to another country and do that there. Um, like I said before, George spoke a lot about God's grace and his love for us and the fact that we have done nothing to deserve it, to earn it. Um, because I don't know about anybody else, but I know I commit some level of sin of just about every day. Uh, I think most of us do, depending on how nitty-gritty and fine-tuned we want to get about that. Um, <clears throat> one thing that he talked about, uh, George and his wife have, have two sons, and they have four grandchildren, which apparently, according to him, are the best-looking grandchildren ever on the face of the earth. Uh, some of you might dispute that, but uh, he talked about when his when his boys were younger and you know kids would color pictures and you know you may not necessarily know what it is but it's beautiful and it's lovely and you hang it on the refrigerator and after a while you know it gets smudged and it gets you know what was it mustard and ketchup and all kinds of I don't know what's going on in his kitchen but um, it gets all kinds of stuff on it just kind of starts to look a little bit ugly and so he said that's one of those things that after the kids go to bed one night you kind of slip it in the trash and put a bunch of stuff over it so they don't ever find it in the trash. Um, and and he, he said, you know, that's, God doesn't do that. No matter what our ugly is, God keeps our picture on his refrigerator. Um, doesn't matter what we've done, we still have a spot. We don't get moved higher and lower on the fruit. We remain on his refrigerator. Um, one thing that struck me because I've had experiences like this is, he said sometimes we experience God's grace as a light switch. You flip on a switch and bam, you got light. Um, thanks to Phil's efforts, we now have really bright lights throughout our church. Um, but sometimes it's just that quick. And, and people have those kinds of redemption stories where it's literally like a light switch was flipped and it, there it is in front of you. And other times it kind of has to come to you a little bit slower. Um, sometimes we have to be hit over the head a little bit. We have to be told um, time and time again. Um, like the lock-in we had scheduled for this weekend, um, I had a death in the family and had to be out of town, lined everything up, thought, okay, that's fine, we'll still go on. And then one of my chaperones became ill, and, and so finally I said, okay, not, I don't need the third sign. It's not meant to be. We will <laughs> reschedule that. Um, so sometimes we just we have to be more attuned to what God is trying to tell us. Um, and I think it's flashed up here a couple of times. Um, sometimes I took pictures of the slides just so I would remember what was <laughs> said if I couldn't write it down. Um, one thing he talked about was the Wesleyan means of grace. And um, there's two of those, works of piety, which is loving God, and then works of mercy, which is loving our neighbors. And he asked the question, he asked two questions. He said, what would the world look like if we loved our actual neighbor? And 
you know, most of us, we're not really in a society anymore where we have like block parties and things like that. Um, I know especially where my parents live, they've made the one neighbor on one side of them, they've maybe said three words to them in about six years that they've lived there. It's just not a, a social kind of atmosphere. And, but what would, it be, what would it look like if we loved our actual neighbor next door to us and they loved the neighbor on the other side of them and it just continued on? And then he said, what if that loving your neighbor also meant that you had to love all the people on the fringes, those outcasts and the people like what the, um, what the boys talked about with, what if you had to love you know, the drug addicts and the people that, are, that won't get help or don't seem to want to help? What if you had to love the, the dancer in the strip club? What if you had, I mean, that's, that kind of stuff was going on. Um, and it goes on every day and we have to just remember that when Jesus said to love our neighbors as ourselves, there were no conditions put on that. It wasn't love your neighbor unless they have a blue house and you don't like blue houses or uh, there was nothing. It was love your neighbor. That was it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Um, <clears throat> and he talked about ways that we can experience God's love and express our love for God. And that's on one of the slides up there. And it was friendship, which we do through our fellowship, through here, through our community in our church. One was worship, that's both private and public worship. One was prayer, and he meant active prayer. I know I've been guilty of saying, oh, I'll, I'll pray for you, and then it, life happens, and it goes out of my head, and I don't do it. You can pray standing in, you know, the automotive section at Walmart. You can pray standing in the middle of Food City. You can pray standing in the middle of the street. We have those freedoms here. Um, and we can do that, so, um, or at least, you know, write it down so that you can come back to it later. Um, and the last one was reflecting on the Bible, and he called that the highest prayer, um, that, that that's what that is. And, and in part of that is to just listen to God, listen to the words that are coming from your Bible. Listen, look at different versions, look at different ways of, of reading it, breaking it down, and really understanding the Word of God. Uh, Ms. Ashley? Good morning, everyone. Um, I would like to stress the fact that while the children do very much enjoy pool, that was not the focus of the weekend. That was a way for them to let off steam. So and I, I love our kids, but they kind of get distracted by the little things. Um, but first of all, I would just like to say what an amazing adventure it was. This is my second time going to Resurrection with the youth. And we may not have a large youth group but I don't necessarily think that everybody in our church realizes how blessed we are with the ones that we do have. So I'd like to take a second and give a round of applause to our wonderful youth group. <clears throat> now that being said, um, the focus of the weekend was all about God's prevenient grace. And there were some things that happened over the weekend that forced me to realize that God's grace is there whether you realize it or not. As humans, we're imperfectly perfect, and we tend to focus on the bad instead of seeing the good that can be there. Um, we knew taking off on Friday evening that our tires weren't in the greatest of shape. Um, I did try to be proactive and keep an eye on it, and there's a, a picture that's flashing of the front passenger tire shredding. <laughs> We woke up to that Sunday, but rather than us get all wrapped up in the negative thing that was happening that could cause us to, to miss out on the communion with 5,000 plus other students and adults and chaperones, that we prayed, you know, God would give us safe delivery down there and a safe trip to the Walmart to drop the van off. Um, so rather than focusing on the negative, we tried to stay to the positive side. Well, look, we caught it early before there was an accident or an opportunity for it to become something, you know, disastrous. On top of that, I woke up Sunday morning at 6 o'clock to Connor vomiting. And, yeah, it was a bummer. <laughs> and I, was, I, I did for a moment. I had a human reaction, and I said, oh, my goodness, why is this happening to me? But rather than focus on that, when I was packing Thursday night for our trip to Resurrection, I came across my little bottle of Zofran, courtesy of my children's pediatrician, and I thought, 
I don't really know why, but I need to take this with me. And if it hadn't been for Georgia's whole sessions, everything about God's grace, I would have never thought that was God telling me that he knew what was going to happen. And he put it in my head, the Holy Spirit, or however you want to look at it, said, Ashley, you're going to need that. You better take it with you. And we were able to get the first dose of medicine in Connor as soon as he had his first episode. He didn't vomit the rest of the time. Granted, Connor and I stayed out in the van for the session on Sunday because I wasn't trying to get anybody else's children sick. But there again, we have this nice, big, comfortable van that has a back seat that he could lay down in. And he napped and, you know, was able to overcome most of it before we ever made it back to Big Stone. And he wasn't miserable. And I just, I, I had, I would never, <clears throat> and I'm sorry, I didn't write any of this down, so I'm stumbling over my words at this point. I would not have thought to give all of that thanks and glory to God if I had not been at resurrection that weekend. So whether we see it or not, and it's not always as evident and apparent as that light switch getting flipped on. Sometimes it's a very gradual thing, and you have to learn to look for it. But his grace is always there, always there. And we just have to learn how to find it. Thank you all. And I want to echo what Ashley said about, you know, how, how good our youth are. Um, we, we were looking at potentially a two hour or more wait to get the van fixed, and that was not part of my plan. Sorry, Phil, neither was spending $500 on new tires. Um, but uh, that turned more to a, uh, we'll beg for forgiveness later and just do it. Um, but, you know, thanks, we had, we were blessed to have the Goodmans there with us, and between their two vehicles, we were able to, I was, Terry and I went and dropped the van off, he brought me back to Cracker Barrel, we were able to sit and eat and enjoy and kill some of that time productively, if you will, um, and then they were able to shuttle all of us back over to the Walmart while we waited, and we only waited about another 20 minutes or so, and the van was done, and, and we were off and going, so, um, you know, and, and I, maybe they did complain, and I was just running around not hearing it, but I never heard any of, of those five boys complain about that, um, about those delays. We got home later than scheduled, but I mean, they, they were just great through that whole thing. Um, and there's, I have worked with many a teenager in my day, and there's some that would have just melted <laughs> at the idea of things having to change suddenly and having to be flexible. Um, and these guys didn't, and I appreciate that. Um, any of the three back there in the corner want something to say about the weekend? Well, I got three uh, shakes of the head, no, so. Um, <laughs> Preacher, anything else? Anything you want to? I know you joined us at the cabin for a little bit. Robert came down for a little while and was at the cabin with us and had some. We had some interesting discussion um, that the the youth aren't really willing to share roundtable style in front of the congregation. Um, so one night you might just have to swing by youth one youth meeting one night to kind of get in on those discussions. But um, but but these guys have really good insights, um, especially for their ages. And and I think you need to take a few minutes every once in a while and just kind of check in with them and, and get their thoughts and everything. Um, we had a really good discussion around the the lunch table um, at the cabin on Saturday afternoon, and and uh, Robert asked some very pointed questions, and and they were just right on it. So.